Good afternoon. My name is Paul Eli. I'm the director of the American Pilgrimage Project based in the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. The project is a partnership with StoryCorps, a renowned uh, story gathering NGO based in Brooklyn. And what, what it's devoted to is the gathering of stories of religious faith as it figures into people's ordinary lives. Over eight or nine years, we've gathered over 200 stories of religious faith uh, by several hundred participants in 20 locations around the country. And we aspire to do um, a similar effort in the years going forward. At this juncture in the project, uh, we're going into our what we think of as our public phase. We've launched a new website. We're pursuing opportunities to uh, have a public presentation of stories and accompanying materials at a museum or gallery or some such. And we're doing events such as this one, a live event involving excerpted conversations uh, that we've recorded uh, during this phase of the project, bringing together the participants to comment on them further. I'm very glad to have you all here. Before we go farther, uh, just a couple of notes. One is that the event is being recorded. And uh, if you've signed up for the event, you will get a link to the recording shortly. The other is that uh, we're going to have a question and answer session uh, partway through. And at, at that point, I'll look to the question and answer tab on Zoom to see what questions have come in. So if you have a question for participants or a general question, please type it into the Q&A section. So without much further ado, let me just uh, tell you what we aim to do here today. Um, two or three years ago, we had a live event in Riggs Library at Georgetown University, in which we convened participants from the American Pilgrimage Project to carry their stories through to the present. We had a pair of participants from Baltimore, Maryland, and a pair of uh, participants from Charleston, West Virginia. The event was a tremendous success, and we've envisioned doing it again on campus uh, with um, campus life being what it is, we decided not to wait any further and that we would just uh, carry on and do our next uh, event in this um, line here on Zoom. So I'm very grateful to have two pairs of participants with us today to talk further about their stories. The first pair, a brother and sister, uh, recorded their stories at Wayne State uh, University in Detroit. Afifa Latif is a human rights activist, advocate, an auditor, and an avid reader. She was recruited to work at a big four public accounting firm out of undergraduate uh, life as an insurance associate within the financial services sector, a role she recently departed from in order to explore opportunities in the social impact sphere. And her brother, Latif, is a human rights activist, muralist, and community organizer. He has worked on dozens of issues as a field organizer for Amnesty International, highlighting the human rights violations of children, women, and most recently, refugees on the southern border and Black Lives Matter protesters. Our other pair, whose story we'll uh, reflect on first, uh, re recorded a conversation together at Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. Chanda Crane is a multi-ethnic multi initiatives resource specialist with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and a member of the Multi-Ethnic Redeemer Church in Jackson, Mississippi. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Mixed Blessing, Embracing the Fullness of Your Multi-Ethnic Identity. And Nasha Whitehead, Esquire, MDiv, is a black woman living with albinism in Mississippi, where she works as an attorney and serves as co-chairperson of the Diversity and Social Justice Committee for the Young Lawyers Division of the Mississippi Bar. A former seminarian and church minister, Nasha currently worships at Word of Life, a local non-denominational multi-ethnic church. So a great welcome to the four of you. Thank you very much for taking part uh, in this conversation. So we're gonna be begin with uh, Chandra and Nasha reflecting on the conversation that they recorded, an excerpt from which we'll play now. Uh, it was recorded in Jackson, Mississippi at Millsaps College, and it was a 40-minute conversation, the two of them sitting and um, talking in a friendly way about uh, their lives of faith and how faith has figured into their lives at particular moments. And we'll hear a short excerpt now. Black woman who's been trapped in a white woman's body. My hair is blonde, <laughs> my eyes are green, and my skin is uh, paler than a lot of my my white homegirl skin is. So uh, <laughs> that caused me to look drastically different mm -hmm. from my family. Mm -hmm. And I obviously had some issues with that growing up, just yeah. being surrounded by beautiful brown skin mm -hmm. and, you know, having to 
not be able to go to the beach or even go to recess. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we've been drawn to each other is because we both know mm. what it's like to be the other and to be an odd duck, even in your family. That's so true. my birth father was Thai and he and my mom met in college and she's white American. Okay. When I was five, she remarried a black man who became my dad, the only dad I ever knew. So I didn't meet my Thai birth mm. family until I was in my early 30s. So it's very much that whole multi-ethnic fusion thing, yeah. which now is so popular. And so I'm so on trend. Um, <laughs> but back in the 80s was not. Oh. Like, how do I affirm <laughs> brothers and sisters with darker skin and mm-hmm. all of the beauty that comes with that, but also all of the heartache societally that comes with that, all That's of the, the injustice that comes with that, but stay authentic to myself yeah, and acknowledge true. that I am a person of color, just not much color. <laughs> A little bit of pigment, <laughs> some melanin. Like no, there's- it's very true. It's very true. And also, and for me, that is complex in a way that I never imagined because mm-hmm. I was speaking with one of my white classmates about something or another. I don't even remember what we were talking about. And my professor goes, when you think about things, when you process certain things, are you a Christian first? Are you a peacemaker first? Or are you black? first oh man and I was like what excuse me (laughs) that is not what we were talking about (laughs) and it stopped me in my tracks because I I mean I I began to to really think about my identity in Christ and my identity as a black human and a black woman in so many different ways because I was like when you're coming from that perspective of, of being a believer in Jesus and like wanting unity then your first thought is let me really you know, seek to understand and not to, you know, first be understood as the book right. goes. So that really helped me a lot. Oh, um, man. So Yeah, that's a powerful moment. The not so happy story that happens a lot is people even question if I'm allowed, whatever that means, to get my MDiv. So every semester I meet some fool <laughs> who's like, well, what program are you in? <laughs> And they say, are you an MFT, which is marriage and family therapy? And I say, no. Always, and then they look at me get that. and then they say, are you master of arts? And then I smile <laughs> and I say, no. Guess again. Guess again. <laughs> exactly. And then there's this pause where they're racking their brains. And actually one guy say, well, there isn't anything else. Oh and I said, yeah, what degree are you getting? And I said, well, I'm getting an MDiv. I said, me too. And he just looked at me like, surely you can't be. And I've, I've had people tell me, well, you can't get an MDiv here. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I did not sneak on campus when no one was looking. Like the administ- I am a registered student. Right. The administration actively recruited me <laughs> and has empowered me and blessed me. And I'm here and I'm taking all the classes, yeah. you know. No, my diploma won't have an asterisk, which I definitely was asked that before. <laughs> no. I'm like, my diploma better have an asterisk. And the asterisk better say putting up with your shenanigans. <laughs> like, I want extra credit for that. An asterisk. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest thing that I see in in multi-ethnic communities is you can't just want to make the minority comfortable. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable as the majority, Mm, right? You have to be willing to 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 sit through a song that you maybe don't like, yeah, but is biblical and beautiful and full of the gospel. Mm. And just because it repeats the chorus or just because it has a certain style to it, you have to be willing to say, well, this is not my preference, but it's right and it's good. And it ministers to my brothers and sisters. And so here it is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have people of color or whatever minority you're trying to reach in leadership, then you just don't think about it. It's your blind spot and you don't notice it. The fact that I get to sit under a black head pastor in Jackson, Mississippi. I know. He's the best. Well, and every time, and this is the same with our last pastor, who is also a black man, every time we do communion, Sometimes when they serve communion to the pastor, you know, it's one of the black elders sometimes, Mm. and more often it's one of the white elders. And every time I see our black head pastor in this church building where people were turned away traditionally being served communion by this white brother, like I just, I just choke up. Yeah. Like here it is right here. This is reconciliation in Christ. This Uh is people's preferences being put aside. This is valuing the Imago Dei in humanity and seeing the beauty in all of the colors. Oh, I love it. I, yeah. Every time it gets me.
I so like that conversation. <laughs> you know, I think it, uh, it's at the top of the American Pilgrimage Project list for most laughter in a, in a conversation. <laughs> Here are these issues that are characteristically and not without reason described in a vexed way, issues of racial identity, gender identity, uh, religious identity. Uh, those, those things, if we read the papers, are tearing our country apart. And yet uh, here you are in the spirit of uh, Chandra's book subtitle, embracing the fullness of your multi-ethnic identity. And it's so clear that you're walking the walk just from your demeanor. Is this something that the two of you had was this part of a running conversation or something that you decided to take up for the first time uh, when you sat down for the American Pilgrimage Project? Either one of you could answer. Definitely a part, I think, of a running conversation. Um, what it naturally flowed from us because when we first met, those were the things that we connected on, that we connected about. Um, our love for Jesus, our love for justice, and um, trying to find our place um, and our voices in uh, theology and in the world and our families and society. Those were our initial points of, of contact and conversation. So yeah, it definitely was a part of a running conversation, I, I think, what you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think we recognize the kindred spirit in one another, um, both physically, because we realized there was something different about our appearance than a lot of people, but also just sense of humor. So I think that's why it was so fun. And, and I think too, that's the story of minorities, of marginalized people, of people of color, is you have to learn how to laugh. You have to learn how to truly feel the limit and the sadness, but also truly see the sense of humor in it um, to survive and to thrive even. There's an old Southern saying that says sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. That's <laughs> so right. I embrace that quite a bit. Do you remember anything? And if you don't, uh, I, I would, it makes perfect sense if you don't. But I'm wondering how that first encounter take takes place. How do you? How do multi-ethnic people of different backgrounds recognize each other and say we're we're kindred in this in this experience of different. Our, our experience of difference makes gives us the sameness that we should embrace. How, you know, how, how does it happen initially? How do you start to, how do you start the conversation that wound up with the two of you laughing about all this stuff? I honestly don't remember, but to her point, we both look obviously different. Like there's something that I think signals to, that signal to each other that, she and, and you never know like what someone is like I didn't know what her ethnic makeup is and I am black I'm just completely black <laughs> but I've got albinism and so I present as white so I think I, I can't I don't know how the conversation started but just even in the past with other people who may be uh, black or brown or multi-ethnic or whatever the case may be I feel like you throw hints out and you find some mm -hmm. way to let somebody know, hey, I also am other, can we talk about this? And I think those yes. hints come in in different ways, whether it's a joke or whether it's, girl, I like your hair, you know, where'd you get it done? And you just kind of start talking through, well, but you know, so. Right, well, and for us, I mean, I spent my 10 years at the law school as a campus minister following law students around <laughs> saying, can I pray for you? Can I buy you coffee? Stop being so stressed out. It's going to be okay. Um, so I was already in the mode of outreach and talking with students. But obviously, when I'm doing that, like Nasha said, you, you catch something about a person and you realize, and I think that's part of the grief and also the joy of being multi-ethnic or having albinism or being multicultural or just not fitting in those boxes that our society wants to put us into is sometimes we don't see each other because it's easy to miss. Um, but then when we do, there's this sense of, okay, I found someone who is one of my people, even though we may be completely different. And in a lot of ways, Nasha and I have a lot of things in common, but in a lot of ways we don't. And so it's it's that shared experience and that willingness to be vulnerable and that willingness to ask those questions and to find out more about another person. I think if we had just sat down 
after knowing each other casually, it would have been a very different conversation. Um, but we'd already built up that trust and that friendship and that relationship that made it such a fun conversation. It's the working idea of the project and pretty much of StoryCorps too, that conversation uh, makes all things possible and that so many of the difficulties that we face, uh, the American people um, could be um, worked out a bit more if, if we could just talk about these things that aren't discussed sufficiently or with the complexity that they deserve. And I guess I'm taking away from both the recorded conversation and what you're saying about it, that that this conversation has made a huge difference for you, that it's a, a way to um, bridge differences, to explore identity, to uh, connect identity to faith, that this is, um, it's, all, it's all happening as you talk, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and when I had the privilege of writing this book, it, the primary audience is people who are ethnically mixed. So I am part Thai and part white American. But I also have this background of being adopted into a Black family into, with a Black father. And so while Nasha isn't traditionally multi-ethnic, she is fully African-American because of her experiences as a woman with albinism, I wanted to include her in the book. I wanted her story in the book to continue telling that story of what it's like to be othered and what it's like to have a heart that then looks for others and reaches out and understands that boxes are not really God's plan for us. Um, and that Jesus came in a multi-ethnic body, right? Jesus was brown, he was beautiful, and he was also part Jew and part Hittite and part Moabite. Um, and so I think getting to tell Nasha's story, being trusted with Nasha's story, and then being able to tell it in the context of the book was really powerful for me. And so because of the conversation we had, I was able to draw from that conversation and include direct quotes in the book. It was really striking to me to hear in your recorded conversation a number of different ways in which um, questions of uh, multi-ethnic identity are approached from a Christian point of view. There's um, the human person as an image of God. There's uh, this suggestion that uh, I think it comes from the prayer of St. Francis, um, seek not to be understood, but to, to understand. Uh, how um, was was that? Were those connections that you drew, or are they drawn for you in the in the culture of um, divinity school or of the churches that you go to? Where is the initiative coming from to see um, multi-ethnic identity in, in, um, from a, from a Christian perspective? Um, I think, and going back to that particular quote, I know that's something that, that I said in the context of being asked um, by a professor, that question of whenever you are considering the heavy, um, the heavy, heavy weighted matters of the world, do you first see them through the lens of a Christian or see them through the lens um, of a black woman? And it's interesting because when I listened to that clip I thought about how I've revisited that moment uh, so often. And now um, I see the flaw in that question. <laughs> um, mainly because at one point, and I, and I feel like this is, this is characteristic of, I think just Western evangelical theology in general of projecting onto minority people to claim your Christian lens first and to divorce that from your blackness or your ethnic identity. And I'm not there anymore and, and don't do that anymore because at this point, I realized that when my initial response to racial hate or injustice or police brutality, I, I can't see it through, I can't compartmentalize. I am a, a black human, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a black woman, a, a black wife who, who has a black husband who has been arrested due to racial profiling. Um, a black mom, a black attorney, all the things. And so um, I, I can't even remember what you were originally asking, Paul, but just going back to that seeking first to, and it's not that I'm, I don't seek first to understand and not to be understood, but I do in reflecting on that comment, um, it is true that I do seek first to 
to understand. But um, right now, we're having a huge issue um, in this socio-political climate with people understanding. And so, <laughs> uh, I, I, yes, I feel like um, at this point, um, anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm done with that point, but yeah. So. I, guess, I guess I hear you saying, and this is what I heard when I listened to the recorded conversation, that the professor was suggesting that you should, um, your Christian identity should come first and it's almost a test of your faith. Right. Your willingness to put it first. Right. Some time has passed. You said, I'm not there anymore. And my, mm -hmm. my suspicion is that the Christian community is there less than it was because um, the events of this summer, just to take one example, have reminded us of how the, the, the culture insists on um, putting black identity first uh, and and doing it in in, um, in crude and noxious ways sometimes. So you so you your your ability to um, choose which identity you're going to put first is is more complex than the professor's question suggested. Ha have things changed uh, since you when thinking about identity since you two sat down to talk together uh, in this in this, in this story core way. First where all, where is the identity to, question now? I'm yeah, sorry. I'm happy to sit here and let Nasha preach because she is she has got <laughs> it. <laughs> so I'm just going to soak it up. I think part of your question, if I'm remembering correctly, Paul, was where does this concept and does this theology come from? And I think it's been throughout the church, been throughout history, but I think it has been diluted and even somewhat poisoned in modern evangelicalism in the United States in white culture. Um, because we have forgotten that Jesus wasn't blue eyed and white and uh, an American, right? We've forgotten that. And so the effort to reclaim our understanding of the beauty and the diversity of people around the world, of cultures around the world, um, I think takes a lot of theological work. And so I know Nasha and I are both really passionate about that. And so it is a journey of taking the, the significance of what we believe, Christ and Him crucified him loving others, us being called to love others, and then figuring out how it plays out in day-to-day -day life, in particular theology. And so I think Nasha and I, and most Christians, most believers of any faith are growing in our faith, right? And are figuring out, okay, what does it mean then that I see things a little differently? And I think what I was able to discover with doing the research and growing in my faith is it's not that we have to choose um, our identity in Christ above all else, it's that it undergirds all else. So I am first and foremost a Christian, absolutely, but that doesn't mean that I then become this bland, boring, culturalist person. It actually, that knowledge informs what it means to be a mixed woman, what it means to be uh, a seminarian, what it means to be a minister, what it means to be a friend. And so the, all of those roles are actually made more beautiful and more important and more significant because of that relationship with Jesus. So it's it's definitely a journey. And I think it's one that the church has ebbs and flows of learning and doing well, and then other periods where we don't. Well, uh, amen to that. You can preach to yourself and you just, just did. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> uh, so do you want to uh, um, fo follow up with a little pre uh, preaching or, or you want to take a different direction, Nasha? Uh, I'm interested in what this, this uh, midrashing of the conversation can offer to to viewers. Uh, what um, what what is your experience um, thinking about identity from all these different points of view? Um, uh, enabled to grasp that is that you're particular and to share with others. Um, I think for me, I I think about um. So James Cone's one of my favorite theologians, the father of Black liberation theology. And um, I recently revisited an interview of his where he was talking about why he pinned all of the Black liberation theology, um, that, that whole mission and message. And he talked about how when he was in his late 20s, I guess, um, the civil rights movement was at its peak. And of course, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was the leader of that. And then he there was Malcolm X over here leading the Black Power Movement as well as the Black Consciousness Movement. And he struggled as a Christian, um, you know, he struggled with, the, with Martin's philosophy because he felt like it, 
that he didn't really account for his blackness in the way in ways that he should have and so in a lot of ways he was drawn to the black power movement but he wasn't ready to set aside christianity because of his love for jesus and because of how his faith had just cultivated you know the essence of, of who he was and so he you know he was thinking about the fact that i can't i can't divorce again there's that word my blackness from my Christianity and and that's that's where I am personally um knowing that I am a follower of Jesus I am a lover of Jesus I and I do embrace all of those ideals and everything that scripture uh, calls me to do and calls me to be but at the same time um I've got to I've got to see things through um this lens of my experience um and and my culture and, and my refusal to compartmentalize, I'll just be honest, it, when I look at the world today and everything that's going on, it leaves me with a lot of unanswered questions, um, a lot of unsolved problems, <laughs> and um, leaves my heart unhealed in a lot of ways. But I'd rather, I'd rather bring all of me um, to my analysis of what's happening and why it's happening and um, and the hindrances to, to, to prog progress to a better place, I'd rather do it from that place than say, well, I've got to only think about it. I need to only think about it this way um, in order to get the quick, uh, safe and easy answer. Um, and that goes back to, again, Dr. King, one of my favorite pieces by him is Letters from a Birmingham Jail. And you know he talks about there's a difference between a positive piece and a negative piece. There's a, um, a negative piece that's the absence of tension, but there's a positive piece that is where there's the presence of tension, but also in that place, the presence of justice. And so um, I prefer the positive piece where there is tension and complexity and confusion and just sometimes just utter, utter hopelessness <laughs> in order to get to that place um, where where we are um, making progress in um, a more fruitful and sustainable way. I definitely felt the th themes that you just struck, the complexity, the willingness to live with the questions, to make tension uh, creative and positive and not um, negative and, uh, and oppressive. That's true in the recorded conversation and all the more tr true in, in, the, in the work that the two of you just did, teasing out its implications. I'm, I'm really grateful to both of you. I'm imagining that we're gonna have some questions uh, about your conversation during the Q&A period. Uh, so um, hold those thoughts. And meanwhile, uh, we'll turn to the conversation um, that uh, Hamza Latif and Latif Latif had at Wayne State University a few years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, the September 11th attacks had created some um, difficulties for American Muslims. And I think it was that in mind that uh, uh, some of the conversations at Wayne State took place. And uh, let's listen to the two of you, um, Afifa and Latif, uh, talk, talk together about your experience as American Muslims. I remember, I think I was seven or eight, being on the playground Parents would wait for their kids to basically leave. And I remember standing near the fence because we were still in the school and they were outside the school. One of the parents yelled terrorist at me. It's one of those moments that it doesn't make sense to you. So you didn't comprehend it at the time? No, but you know that it should hurt. Mm -hmm. And it does hurt, but you can't comprehend why because you can't understand someone that's so much older than you saying something like that to you. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I was really young when 9-11 happened, so I didn't really understand that. And I didn't understand that I had to, like, bear the burden of what had happened. How did you identify you as a Muslim? Because I wore a scarf. And I remember wearing, like, mini skirts <laughs> and a scarf. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to wear that scarf because it was beautiful to me. <laughs> And so, yes, when I came here, it was just a completely different understanding of, like, what a scarf was. And I can't imagine that, like, it can stand for so much more for some people in a light that I'd never even thought of it in. Right. So when that happened, your initial reaction was just that you were hurt, but you didn't really know why? Yeah, because that was just, like, one of the first things that, like, had happened. I think this was, like, in the first week of school or something. So it didn't make sense to me. And then the next thing that I remember is being on you know like those uh, things on the playground that look like uh, like a spider web yeah, yeah i think yeah, they're yeah. called a geometric dome i remember hanging from it mm -hmm. and i remember somebody 
climbing inside of the dome, calling me a terrorist. And I remember wearing a peach scarf and they just mm -hmm. ripped it off of my head. That was somebody that was in my class. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the most scarring incidents that I've had. You feel like you don't have dignity. And I feel like even now, sometimes when I feel really insecure, it's from moments like that where you feel so, so, so small at that point. You wanted to wear the scarf earlier than you actually started. And both my papa, your mom and dad were actually against it and they wanted you to hold off. Yeah. And it was around the time of 9-11. Yeah. So you decided to wear it and then it contributed to you being bullied at school. So then when yeah. you would come home and talk about it. Everybody in the family said, take it off. My aunts told me to take it off. Cousins, my brothers, yeah. cousins, like my dad, my mom especially, because she didn't want me to go and through that. And you were really young. Do you remember that one thing that you said that really impressed mom and dad about it? It was like, if I take it off, I'm still the same person. Nothing has changed and about me. And they're not me. going to love me anymore or less. And they're not going to love me anymore This is like an eight-year-old talking. Because that's all that it is, right? It's just a piece of scarf. Like, my personality is not going to change. Mm -hmm. I think it still holds true to me, though, because nobody else is going to speak up for you. So whether or not you're ready for it or not, you need to do something about it in your community. Thanks to both of you for that conversation. There's so much to say about it. I'm going to begin with what I'm feeling, which is just how how present you make your your own feelings to us through the conversation. There's no distance in my hearing between what you face as a girl and what you describe as an adult. The, it suggests that those um, feelings are, are still very much alive uh, within you. Um, is that the case? Yeah. Um, you know, I would think that from elementary school to undergrad to now, you know, having moved away from Michigan to Chicago to live in like a different city, that would kind of change. And I think in a lot of ways, I've become a lot stronger having, you know, moved to Dearborn, which is, um, you know, it has a very big Muslim population, a very big Arab population. So you kind of stop thinking of yourself as another. Um, and then kind of moving to Chicago where I thought I would see more diversity. Um, and, you know, I think I still felt the feeling of being, of being somebody different. And it's always like you're living your life completely fine. And then you'll have moments where somebody just switches that for you. So for example, if I am on, so when I would take the subway in the morning, you know, to work in Chicago, I would just be, um, everybody was just going in and it's completely fine. And then you had a couple of people that came on the subway and they started being really disruptive and they started saying really inappropriate um, things and kind of harmful things. And so it was me and a white girl that was standing next to me. And then there were, um, there was a white guy that was also on the subway and and instead of um, you know trying to protect both of us, the white guy pretty much only started to act like he knew this white girl who was like a stranger and just kind of made it seem like they were together so that you know she would stop being harassed. And then I was just on the sideline, you know, and I had to kind of fend for myself, kind of had to protect myself, um, you know, get off of the subway. And so it's moments like that where all of a sudden you realize that like you're an outsider, and that's in like a passive time. So then you know, when you get out of a Cubs game in Chicago and I'm walking, I have, I have very little confidence that if somebody said something racial to me and given the current political climate, you know, and the anti-Islamic rhetoric, that somebody would kind of step up or protect me. You know, it's that same feeling of feeling like an outsider, of feeling unprotected that kind of goes along. You mentioned the current climate, uh... So when you made the recording, obviously 9-11 uh, was closer to that time, but, but um, things are at least as acute or even more so in this moment. Is that, is that what, uh, what you mean? Yeah, no, I definitely think that in a lot of ways things have become worse, right? Because you have um, this anti-Islamic rhetoric started gaining so much more traction during the last presidential election, right? Because you have an administration that's coming in um, 
talking about dealing with the Muslim problem. That's entertaining the concept of a Muslim registry that implemented a Muslim ban, right? Like you're having all of these things kind of play out. And the scary thing is, is the traction that it's gaining within the community or the fact that people aren't outraged about it because to a certain level, that means that people are, are okay with it or you know, there's a sentiment that people don't feel safe around Muslims. And I think that's really disheartening. Latif, what do you, do you feel the same way? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, you, you talked about, you know, the incident happening closer to 9-11 and the question always comes up, you know, are things better? Have things changed? And if so, you know, how? And, you know, our experience in America <clears throat> started around that time, a few years after 9-11. However, you know, the anti-Muslim rhetoric in my mind is, is broken into three three different pieces of life for me. There was the pre-9-11, uh, there was the 9-11 and the war and terror and everything that came with it. And then there is the Muslim ban era. And so each of those different areas had different implications on the way I would walk out of my house and go to my car and go to class or go to work um, and go to the, the you know, in, in high school, how I, I was in the locker room and then in, in, at work, how I was in the break room and then, you know, how I am in my social groups. And each of those different eras have had vastly different effects on, you know, the way people approach me, the way I approach people. And, you know, what Afrifa is describing, Paul, the, the video clip that you, or the sound clip that you played, we've heard it a few times and I swear to God, it is not any easier listening to it now than it was back then because like Afrifa said, you know, uh, whereas the, the modality of those microaggressions and there's nothing micro about them, um, the modality changes, uh, but, you know, the frequency and the people that we are victimized by from those, those have not changed at all. One of the things that's come up in some of the several hundred conversations that we've recorded is how um, often uh, religious identity is given a negative charge in childhood because of instances like this. And when I, in, in the way of a literary critic, I suppose I was saying to you, Afifa, I just felt the presentness of, of your pain. And you're saying that Latif, that it's very present to the two of you now. And that your, your ta ta taxonomic approach to it is so convincing. There's these three eras. Uh, it, to me, heartbreaking that we can actually describe eras and modalities of American discrimination against Muslim along a timeline with such precision. You know, that, that is just so wrong that you even have to dispassionately break your life into eras and, and make distinctions of that kind. I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of angry and disturbed at once, but I also want to hear, what does it mean to walk out of your apartment or your house uh, in the Muslim ban era? What, what um, can, you, can you put us alongside you and what does that feel like? Latif. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm, uh, it's interesting um, because a lot of times in these conversations we talk about, you know, the hate crimes that we were victims of. Um, and I try to take myself out of that situation and look at what other people are seeing when they look at me. And so if you want to be very specific with the Muslim ban era, what's absolutely crazy is that because I work for a nonprofit that is a human rights watchdog, um, the day that that executive order was put on the table, me and my coworkers were sent immediately to O'Hare International Airport to make sure that we had a human rights uh, organization presence there along with a bunch of lawyers that were picking up folks and saying, you're gonna need legal representation right now, do not say anything. And so, you know, it was mentioned earlier uh, by the other two panelists about how, you know, laughter and smiling is a big part of our coping mechanism when the weight of the entire community is on you already. And then yet you have to go and be at the forefront of it on, on that level where, there was white folks staring at me while I'm in a suit, while there was brown people coming out of the gate and being like huddled into this tent. And it was, it was a crazy scene because what was happening there was people were looking at one another, like, are you white? Okay, so then you're safe, but are you safe because you're with airport security or because you're a traveler? If you're a traveler, it's fine. 
Um, if you're brown, that means you should be in the tent, but you're in a suit, therefore you have some kind of authority. And But you also have a beard, so I'm very confused. And the person you're standing with is a big black man who's my manager, one of my best friends. And it was just like, that's what was happening. The chaos that not to describe, you know, the, the controlled chaos and the tension that needs to be there, all of it was there at the airport the day the executive order was on the table. Um, and in my job, is 75% travel. So as we all know, sitting in front of Zoom has now become my full-time job. But prior to that, you know, being at the airport constantly, you know, all the stories and jokes you hear about the stand of comics about going through airport security, they're all true. You know, it's it's a it's a grueling process. I have now reduced my travel back down to nothing. I carry minimal electronics because if I carry travel with my work and personal laptop, that's a red flag. Um, I only wear thin, thin t-shirts. And I stopped wearing hoodies because they have zippers on them. Like, those are the things that, you know, because I get it. I'm going to get harassed. I need to get to my meetings on time. So I will make it easier for you to violate my civil liberties so I can get through some of the stuff on time. You know, sometimes I like to do what other people like to do and get a sandwich at the airport. And you can't do that if you're in airport security the whole time. It seems to me that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, President Trump's personal contempt for Muslims is so much part of the equation. It's not a politician's strategic move or a geopolitical idea. It's just at the level of animal contempt. And and does that um, is that true? And does that um, manifest itself in the in the way uh, the encounters that you have in everyday life? Either either one of you could answer. FIFA. Yeah, um, you know, I am trying to think about how to, in our, you know, I think the hardest part is having people understand that these policies or these things are not just table talk, right? It's not just something that you post about once and, or, or a couple times even, these are, these are policies that people have to deal with. So when the idea of a Muslim registry was being floated around, right? Somebody might read that and somebody might post about it and say, oh, this is crazy. But in my mind, the fact that my friends or my colleagues weren't outraged by this concept or the fact that in their mind, there wasn't like this neon sign being like, like how is this even allowed to exist? Like, why are we even having conversations about this, you know? it made me feel like it makes you feel very scared with how I should be interacting with people daily, you know? Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, that, that also shows up at work a lot then in forms of like microaggression because you'll have people feeling very comfortable posing questions like, don't you have to wear that? Or, um, you know, don't people, overseas have to wear burqas or like, you know, women aren't really given rights in your culture, right? Or in your religion, like, or, you know, making fun of the way that Arabic's written or, you know, my daily encounters where if I look at somebody, I can tell that they're visibly scared of me. You know, like when you walk past somebody, they'll like grab their child and they'll like move them, right? So it's become very explicit. And I feel like before it used to be, you know, um, it wouldn't be as explicit, so. Again, it's heartbreaking to hear um, and the, the range of uh, aggressions that you can describe even in a short conversation like this just suggests how extensive it is. The, the question uh, panel is now open. There's a question if you want to put a question into the Q&A panel. I thought it might be interesting to have, um, say, uh, Nasha or Chandra ask questions of Afifa or Latif or the other way around. but. Um, I guess I'd like to ask one more question first uh, for either um, Latif or Afifa. And it's, what does it mean that so much of the um, animus against American Muslims comes from people who profess to be on the side of religion? It's the most, um, the ones who are really bullish about American Christianity or about the, or the, the biggest haters of supposedly secular America seem to also be um, uh, kind of charged up against Muslims. This is just so contradictory to me. How does that uh, shake out for you? I think um, 
uh, Fifa, I'll, I'll take this question really quick. Um, I think when we're talking about the hypocrisy related to the angle that you just described, um, I, I tend to take a step back from that and look at this entire conversation of of religious identity, of racial identity as like sort of like a bouncing uh, back and forth between two different areas. For instance, there's a hypocrisy of me wanting everyone to understand that I'm brown, I'm a Muslim, I'm a straight male, but then I'm also exhausted of explaining myself. There's a hypocrisy there. There's a hypocrisy of being extremely religious and being super accepting, but then using that to deny certain people human rights. It's what I literally on a day-to-day -day basis, that's what I do. Um, you know, so there's, that's sort of the area that I try to build empathy where I'm like, okay, if I'm feeling exhausted of explaining myself, then other folks must be as well of trying to consolidate these two sides of themselves. When we're, whether we're talking about abortion, whether we're talking about the death penalty, which is something I work on quite a bit, whether we're talking about the refugee crisis, what you just described leads to, you know, the immigration policy about the question you had asked earlier, Trump's independent thoughts and feelings on this affecting policy, whereas a lot of religious groups are, like you said, very openly against immigration and that sort of thing. With my, the work that I do, working with the resettlement projects and refugee um, placement, I would say 90% of them are through Christian Jews and orgs while they are still openly advocating against certain human rights. And so Nasha mentioned the confusion uh, and, and the chaos that comes with working on something that's so nuanced. I think that's what we're seeing now. It's, it's easy to say that some groups are just openly haters, uh, but, but I think as with everything with race, identity, religion, these are, these are things that are so far away from black and white and so much in the gray that um, we, we, it, it just is a, it requires much more of a nuanced approach and not everybody has time for that kind of conversation. It's amazing to hear what you just said, that um, your experience of your own inner division, uh, once um, eager to present yourself and weary of the need to do so, leads you to um, analogize that to the experience of a, like a waste, racist white Christian who's tired of uh, having to uh, um, go about life in, in multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious America. The empathy there is just off the charts. Uh, I'm gonna take that away from this conversation for sure. Uh, Nasha or Chandra, uh, qu questions for Latif or Afifa? You well, seem to have so much to say to one another. I just wanna be y'all's friends, okay? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm all, I am feeling the vibes, okay? I, I, I'm resisting the urge to do the white girl tears and like repent and apologize <laughs> for how Christians have treated you. And I think there's a certain joy in knowing, and here I am going to cry, that we can find commonality in our griefs. I grieve with you. I grieve with you for the injustice and the bull crap that's been done against you. Um, and so I guess that leads to my question of like, how can, what in your experience has shown, what things minister to you, what things encourage you, what things are helpful to see you as Brown and Muslim and Americans and all of your complexity without stereotyping you? You know, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. If you could, do you wanna uh, attack it? Um, or answer? I, yeah, you can start and then I can add. Um, yeah, of course. So, I mean, when it comes to, you know, feeling seen or feeling heard and not being tokenized, I think when we talk about identities, um, either, I think it was either you or Nasha that mentioned, like, in, we often are faced with, well, what are you first? Are you a Muslim first? Are you a bearded hipster? Are you a terrorist? <laughs> which, which category do you fall in? And please identify yourself so that I can treat you the way I stereotype that identity button. Um, and again, just moving away from like being Muslim or being brown or, or that sort of thing, I think it's very important for us to understand the stereotypes that are associated with those titles and then be able to divulge our information. Because when I get asked that question, I sit back and I think like, well, how do I want Chandra or Nasha or Paul to treat me? Do I want them to treat me like a human rights activist? 
Do I want them to treat me like a recent immigrant? Do I want them to treat me like an artist? And that really shapes how they treat me. So for instance, I've been on panels where I, I, I'll do a mural and they'll call me up. I'll be next to some, some white artists. White artists get questions like, what inspires you? My questions are, what did your parents say when you took up art? I'm just like, they said what every artist's parents say, get a real <laughs> job. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's, that's what they said. Um, and, and so my, my, my thoughts and feelings are more along the lines of like, what are the stereotypes behind each identity? Let's talk about those. Um, and panels like this, you know, feeling this, this is the, you know, like you said, I just want us all to be friends. Like, it seems like we have so much to talk about. So, uh, I'll stop there. Afif. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think, yep, having those conversations, I think moving away from um, our terminology that we use to talk about Muslims and Islam and Islamophobia, you know, I, I think one of my biggest things now in my mid 20s when I've kind of reclaimed my identity and I feel comfortable with my identity has been being called a moderate Muslim or like a liberal Muslim and having it be like, that's okay, but if you practice any more, you're on the spectrum of being a fanatic or being like a terrorist, you know? And me practicing my religion more doesn't mean that I'm gonna go there. I think that that terminology kind of perpetuates this idea of Islam being like, you know, a hateful religion. And, um, and I think from 2001, you know, the conversations are slightly changing, but not that much. It's always Islam 101, where you have to start off and be like, Islam's not dangerous like you know it's not a violent religion um and starting off there so yeah i think changing up our terminology how we talk about it creating space where you can have these nuanced conversations um is so important thank you and and that that answer points to one of the questions that's come in from the audience uh, and as i ask you to answer it i'll also put out a general question that has been posed to all of you the question for all of you is uh, do you and how do you lean on your faith during these turbulent times? Will you ponder that? I'll ask Latifa or uh, Fifa to um, answer this particular question. How much, and it speaks to the questions of the kind of definitional matters that you both just addressed. How much do you think racism is embedded in or a foundational cause of Islamophobia? So it's kind of, is it race? Is it religion? Is it some, 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 Compose. You know, that's a that's a very very good question, and I think it's a question that people don't often ask. Um, is it religion based or is it race based? Um, you know, oftentimes people talk about well, most folks that are educated are not racist um, and that sort of thing. And I think it's it's a little bit simpler than that in the sense that people that don't like people that don't look indiscriminate with their hate, which is actually what unites a lot of minorities together which was mentioned earlier, we have a lot of similarities. The first person that got slapped in the face and, and harassed after 9-11 wasn't even Muslim. You know what I'm saying? He actually belongs to a group which has been involved with a huge genocide against Muslims. And, and that's a great example of the question that was asked is that, is this a race thing or a religion thing? Um, and, and, and I think that just dictates like how much of this is just pure uh, you know, racial elitism. And, and, and preserving that rather than it being us as, as the issue. Because like Afifa said, if she took her scarf off and didn't identify as a Muslim, she would have still gotten ridiculed. If I shaved my beard, which I didn't have one before sixth grade, because I've had a beard ever since, a uh, pretty big one at that, um, I was still made fun of and harassed. You know, I always look different. So, and I, hope, I hope that correspondingly, you, you could say that um, Islam is not a violent religion a hundred times, but if the animus has to do with skin or facial hair or um, visage, that's not going to um, uh, absolutely change that person's mind in the least. Absolutely. And, and you know, this indoctrination, there's a question like how much of this is embedded in, in Islamophobia. I think, you know, the, the history of, of our social media, of our movies, going back even pre pre 9-11, you know, people's going to hate me because this is one of our favorite movies, which is uh, Iron Man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a scene where where this guy, the villain, he describes this. Of course, the whole movie, uh, you know, Muslims are bad guys. I'm not going to be redundant with that. Everybody knows. But he literally says 
the show was seen in Afghanistan or northern Pakistan. And uh, the guy looks at this Arab and he goes, that is a dysfunctional, mute, scrupulous camel jockey. And this is a children's movie, a superhero movie that all of us watch and Afif and I admire. You know, that is giving somebody, here's what a terrorist looks like. Here's the language to use when you're presented with it, uh, with someone like that. So it's no, I don't, and I think that's what you said, the empathy part kicks in for me a lot because I'm like, these kids grew up watching Aladdin that came out in 92 that only had the good Arabs had American accents, the bad Arabs had bad accents. And then there was Iron Man and American Sniper and all the Bond movies where everybody who was, you know, not speaking English was the villain. You know, that's the indoctrination that that leads to Islamophobia. And just to wind it back to the conversation, that's why you're under that um, uh, structure and the, and the playground and you're already getting harassed. You're, you're a child. Uh, that so early does the indoctrination happen that other children have already um, been tutored in Islamophobia uh, before they even reach the playground, I guess. Yeah, but you know, I think the other thing is that like we become hyper aware at a younger age, right? Like minority group, the kids become hyper aware. And I think that it instills, and this is furthering Latif's point, we've talked about this empathy for the majority because you're like, you know what? I know why you feel uncomfortable. It's because I don't look the same as you. And so we learn to develop language on how we can communicate our, our commonalities with people. And so it's a lot easier for us to bond with people and to kind of make them feel at ease that like, don't be scared of me. We have this in common. And at a very, very young age, right? Because not only am I seeing how other people are interacting with me, I'm seeing that when I opened the TV, when I was younger, I did not have anybody that looked like me. All I had were, um, you know, people being portrayed as terrorists or there were people, you know, who were brown slash Indian who were like always presented as like the lowest group within a school setting, right? So even if I didn't think that of myself, it was reinforced in media. So while you're dealing with your normal insecurities as like a sixth grader, fourth grader, you're also thinking about how somebody else is kind of seeing you as well. And you have to balance all of those things and be super empathetic and sympathetic to people, you know, and how they approach you and give them. I was talking about this with, with my family the other day. The reason when I think about high school and my elementary school years, I feel very um, like suffocated and I feel very scared and it kind of just makes me cold. And it's because, you know, people who were bullying me in elementary school, I kind of had to become friends with them in high school. And you have to kind of let it go, you know, and be okay with that and be like, it's okay. Like, you know, you did X, Y, and Z to me. You said X, Y, Z to me. You made me feel like an outsider, but now I'm going to be friends with you. And you have to like kind of reconcile that. So I don't know. I think a, a big form of being an outsider is also being super empathetic and understanding where people are coming from. It's really powerful to hear and, and In both of your accounts, it just seems so genuine. I just want to learn from, from you. Uh, your, your last set of remarks also raised what is the general question, and I'll point it um, Chandra and, and Nasha, at least first, which is what about in the other direction? What is, does, does faith serve as, serve as a form of consolation or a, a refuge from um, identity strife or? What, what, what's the, what role does it play? Chandra or Nasha? I can go. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you use that word consolation. I think it very much does. I think one of the, the most beautiful parts, some of the most beautiful parts of scripture are the ones like Nasha said, where there aren't any answers, where the psalmist is crying out and saying, why isn't God doing something? Why do we feel this? Why have you allowed? You know, I, I had nowhere near the, the level of trauma in, in grade school, but why are other kids asking me if I know Kung Fu and making fun of me and you know, doing this with their eyes? Because I, I looked much more Asian when I was younger. And especially why is God allowing people to rip? I, just the, the, the image of FIFA of you with that beautiful peach scarf against your beautiful dark skin and it just being snatched from you is so awful. And so there is a consolation in being able to cry out to God 
and say, why? And, and then being willing to sit with the uncomfortable silence sometimes. But I think in answer to your, your other question as well, Paul, it also, I felt recently, and I think Nasha would say the same, as I've come into more of my own, as I've been uh, becoming more and more uh, of a professional <laughs> and growing up and, and learning to assert my voice and realizing how much that is scriptural, that, um, that I can take that empathy that, that they have, uh, Fifa and Latif have so beautifully articulated, but I can also in a kind way say, no, that's not right. You have no right to dehumanize me that way and to do it in a way that is not alienating, but also not just cowering. Um, and I think that's very clear in, in my faith and our faith to say, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And it's not skin color that's right and wrong. And it's not um, even the expression of our religion that's right and wrong. It's whether we are being loving and kind um, and seeking for the good of others. And it is wrong to have a ban on a certain ethnic group or a certain religious group. And it is wrong to harass and, and abuse others. And it is wrong to not be willing to have these friendships and to stretch ourselves. That is not what our faith says. Our faith says the opposite. Nasha? I, um, similar to Afifa and, and not to exactly correlate my experience with yours, but I also was bullied in school. Actually, my mom's a principal. I made a joke um, to her about how I would have loved virtual learning. <laughs> back in middle and high school <laughs> because I dreaded going to school. Um, I, I made the joke, I think, in, in, our, in our clip about being a black woman trapped in a, a white woman's body. And I'm, I've got makeup on now, but like my eyelashes, and my eyebrows are translucent for the most part. And um, I, was, I was bullied quite a bit and had lots of incidences and instances where um, I too was stripped of my dignity. And for me, my faith played a um, significant role in being able to emerge from a place of honestly, at one point, even being suicidal when I was in middle school. Um, there were certain scriptures that I really uh, latched onto, like, um, you know, man or humans look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that what we see is, is fleeting, but um, our, our inward person is being renewed day by day. And so finding, understanding that being truly beautiful and um, valuing myself and valuing others meant cultivating a character of love and generosity on the inside and not focusing so much on the outward appearance. And, and that was really healing for me as, as a young person. And and just talking about just what is going on in the world, like what is going on in the world. But um, I, I find such consolation in, in my times, my personal times in, in the presence of God. Like Chandra said, um, just crying out and asking questions that I can't really ask of anyone else. I remember having a moment and I, I feel all the things very strongly. So like Chandra, I may tear up a little bit here, but um, I remember asking God, Black Lives Matter. I remember asking him, I'm like, Lord, okay. <laughs> black Lives Matter is uh, saying that a black life matters. That to me, that is the simplest <laughs> concept and the fact that it is a topic of controversy and that it is a topic that is opposed, a, a fact, a, a, a central, just basic thing, a black life ma matters, that people have a problem with a black life mattering. I can't say it enough. Um, being able to express those kinds of things um, in, in that, those personal times with God, that, that brings me consolation. Again, even though I don't always leave that place with answers and solutions, at the end of the day, I can't control anybody but myself. And I'm able to, in those times, walk away with, okay, well, Black lives don't matter to everybody. So now what can I do? What can I do on a daily basis, on a moment by moment basis, 
um, to, to bring light, to bring love, to bring truth to power, what can I do and how can I inspire and encourage others to do or not do, <laughs> say or not say things that are going to be contrary to that, that very, um, to, to everyone in society being, being valuable and being worthy of, of, of love and, and respect, just respect. It's kind of like to me, a Saturday Night Live comedian, Michael Che, I don't know how much of you, uh, how many of y'all watch him, but he actually has a standup where he talks about Black Lives Matter. And he says, we're starting the negotiations that matter. So he's like, can we agree that Black Lives exist? Can we just start there? <laughs> you know, so, uh, but anyway, just finding, finding ways each and every day, moment by moment to, um, to be, to be the solution, to, you know, to be the solution I want to see. Is that, is that how that quote goes? <laughs> be the change you want to see. Is that what it is? That's it. Gotcha. <laughs> this is so powerful hearing you speak, hearing you all speak. I, I can't remember the last time I felt so um, full of a feeling to want to go and do likewise when I get off Zoom <laughs> and go and do something, uh, to do a little good in the world. You reminded us, Nasha, of some of the um, uh, awful aspects of, of communal life, the groups and, and bullying and all that. I guess what I'm reminded of from this conversation is uh, just in a structural way, as, as we wrap up, the, uh, I've done several dozen Zoom events, but I can't think of one where I, was, where I felt such an acute sense of um, deprivation that we're, it's not a live event we're not going to all kind of move into the next room with food and talk for another hour <laughs> because that's what this feeling is like that like we should all just carry the conversation out into the next room and and pick it up more casually I, I hope you felt something like the same and those of you who are um, viewing as well and I hope that we do find a way to further this conversation the event had its basis in the wish to further the conversations that you did in Jackson and in Detroit. And so we've already taken a next step. Um, maybe we can all think together about what the, the next next step would be because I'm definitely feeling it and I hope you are too. Thank you so much. And uh, let's, let's, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank I want to so hear much. about Latif's art and I want to hear about Afifa's scarf collection and <laughs> their reading and we can talk about uh, all of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> My husband is a Marvel collector, by the way, so we got an entire room dedicated to it. <laughs> That's very cool. <laughs> so, Thanks, but thank you so much uh, uh, for, for having us and then the other panelists too. I know a lot of the stuff, whereas you know, the cameras are kept with smiles, I know there's a lot of pain behind uh, recalling and sort of through this trauma. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for, for sharing as openly as you did. It really matters. This is an honor. Absolutely. This is really an honor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Oh, it was really great meeting everyone too. Yes, same. Thanks to all and thanks to all who have tuned in and uh, look for a video of the event uh, in your inbox if you registered through the Berkeley Center. Thanks again. Uh, and thanks. Thanks uh, for joining us. Paul Eli with the Berkeley Center at Georgetown and the American Pilgrimage Project.